My name's Brian Woodward. I'm from Informatics, uh, who make Piranesi. With me today, I've got Robin Lockhart from OBM International, who is actually a SketchUp and Piranesi user. And we're going to split this hour into two. I'm going to give a quick introduction to Piranesi. Um, actually, while you, before we start, can you put your hands up if you own Piranesi? Okay, who's, who's used the trial? And who's never heard of Piranesi? Okay, so we're going to try and um, I'm going to try and broach an introduction to Piranesi, show a few advanced techniques as well. So hopefully there'll be something for everybody. Um, and then after half an hour, Robin's going to take over and give a user's perspective of using SketchUp and Piranesi together. Okay. See that. Okay. So the outline of the presentation is just to start off with a quick background about what Piranesi is. Um, I'm going to show some images of what people have done with Piranesi and then get quickly into a demonstration of the basics of Piranesi using the locks and placing cutouts. I'll digress then a bit to show some more advanced techniques and then I'll hand over to Robin. At any time, if you've got any questions, just throw your hand in the air and, and we'd, we'd like to get an interaction going. So we'll answer questions as they go along or if the question's too difficult, I'll say, well, I'll handle that at the end. Okay, so what is Piranesi? Piranesi is basically a 3D paint program. It's very much like Photoshop. It's got very similar tools to Photoshop, but it's the, what, what you'll come to see is that the locks in Piranesi give it a lot more power. The locks are a tool that enables you to paint without actually having to use the last tool, tool or the selection tools as you would in Photoshop. Um, it is not a modeling tool. People see a demo and they think they can turn the image around because you're doing everything in 3D. It's not. It's a static view of your model. You then start painting it up. It interfaces with a whole suite of renderers. There's a, a list of them there. One of the, the earlier ones that it actually interfaced was, with was actually SketchUp. The Atlas guys at the time saw Piranesi and, and we saw SketchUp for the first time back at Chicago, I think, back 10 years ago and there was an immediate rapport between the two, pro two pro products. They work very well together. Um, the uses of Piranesi, th this is actually what, what I call a, a photorealistic image. It's not really photorealistic. It's not been created by a renderer. It's been hand-painted in Piranesi. And I, I saw this the first time and I didn't believe it. Um, but when you have a look down at the bottom on the roadway, you can see some repetition in the, in the textures. This is from a client in Japan. There's a fairly, there's a small house builder called Masawa Homes. They've got about 500 seats of Piranesi. And they got pretty serious in, in this. And they've got a, a very large library of entourage, trees, plants, and stuff like that. And they're just getting into actually doing plans. And they've actually got a digital camera attached to a remote control helicopter that they send up, uh, hover above the plants, and take photographs. And then they cut them out in Photoshop and use them in Piranesi. Um, you probably recognize this technique. Um, this is by a SketchUp user from Canada, a guy called David Walker. He basically just starts with a, uh, a line drawing generated out of SketchUp, and he just, just starts using Piranesi as a paint tool. Uh, the more traditional use of Piranesi has been you create a photorealistic renderer. This is actually from uh, ADT using Viz Renderer from a guy in Italy. Um, you then add your entourage into Piranesi, you do it a bit of painting, and then run some filters and effects on it to get a, a more traditional type of illustration. <coughs> okay, enough talking, let's, let's look at the product. So this, this is Piranesi. It looks very fit, similar to Photoshop in, in that you've got a series of tools down here on the left-hand side, and you've got options for the tool going along the top. And Can we see the tools? Down the, down the left edge, down here, you've got bright. Have they gone off the edge? Yeah. Oh, OK, sorry. Let me just. 
Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to use, here's the brush tool. Um, and if we want to paint these window frames, yeah, you just haven't got a chance. You can't just click on it and paint. What we're going to do is turn on one of our locks down here called a material lock. And as we hover over the window frame, you can see up here in the top right hand corner, the material name is being um, fed back. So if I click on a window frame and just zap across the drawing, only things in window frame get painted. So I've no need to actually do any selection or what, whatever, I'm just using locks. Now th this works because when an EPIX file is written, not only do you get the, the RGB information from the renderer, you also get information about the depth of each pixel from the eye, and also the name of the material you've assigned in SketchUp with the bucket tool. Okay, So those two channels are used to actually allow you to paint a lot smarter and a lot faster. So not only can we apply colors, we can actually apply textures. And those textures are actually given real world dimensions, so everything's scaled to the model. And we can then actually just get hold of them and maybe tweak them, rotate them at some kind of angle, and, sc and scale them as well. So I'm just going to quickly paint this up, show you how quickly you can paint it up and you drop backgrounds in. It's just point and click at this particular case from a library of stars that we've got saved in our style manager. Now, while you're painting a, an image up, and you might want to go into another view, so a, a trick in version 5 for some more experienced users is actually to turn the style recorder on, which is new, new in version 5. You can actually go record styles. So every time I apply a style to the screen that's new, it will actually go into the style recorder. And then at the end of the session, you can save that to a style file and then use those styles to go and paint up another view of the image later on. OK? Yeah, each, each, time, each time you apply a different set of parameters to the image, it will put a new one in there. So you might end up with some redundant styles in, in, your, in your style file. You just have to tidy them up afterwards. OK, so that's quickly painting things up. Um, a next stage is to add people and trees to your image. Now in Photoshop, well, a lot of Photoshop users do this. They take an uh, image out of Max or wherever, SketchUp, and apply people. But they have to size them by eye and then drop shadows from them as well. Um, just before this, I'm going to make sure I've got my cutout manager visible. and turn shadows on. So you can see as I move this person around the scene, she scales automatically depending on her height. And as I place her, a shadow gets dropped as well onto the ground. And if we go and look at the cutout, the actual dimension here is she's 66.92 inches tall. So if I want to make a six foot, I just type, sorry, my mouse is slipping. I can type 72 in here and reapply and she grows. So everything's done by real world measurements. I can take a tree and point through the building and put it in the background with no need to do any masking. So they're, they're 2D cutouts that actually are placed in the scene and point to the eye. We can also take 3D models, SketchUp models, 3DS fi files, and put those into our scene. So we've got a, a, three, a SketchUp model here of, of a planter that we put in. At the moment, all these are actually still floating in what we call our cutout manager. So any time we can go back to any of these and move them around. So I can, I can tweak this particular cutout. I can get hold of it and rotate it, for instance, around. So I'm just going to quickly put some more in. There's another kind of cutout called a text cutout. So you can do your signage as well. And notice they will actually orientate themselves to the surface where you click on. So I'm just quickly going to put some more people in here. This is a new feature on this particular one. I don't know if you notice it. It kind of looks blurry. Um, at the bottom here on the cutout panel, you've got some styles. So you can actually put the person in normally. And let me just reapply that so it's sharp. I can apply an outline style to it. So I can fill it with white, with a black rim, for instance. Or I can do 
the motion blur technique, which kind of blurs that cutout and gives an effect of motion. You can just see it's just a matter of selecting point, point and click. Um, some new tools in version 5 with the ability to take a cutout and put, put them along a straight line. Or we, we've got what we call our um, same thing. I'm just going to put some lights in here. There's another particular one here. It's like our crowd scene. You can actually take point the tool at a folder of cutouts and, and put, place them down on a random grid. So you can just quickly put in a, fill in a shopping mall or whatever or create a forest of trees. OK, so that's the basics of Piranesi, is actually painting up an image quickly and applying cutouts. Once we get to this stage, the normal technique now is, is to actually save this back into the background, because we've still got our starting point here. And what I'm going to do is press this button here, which takes a copy of it into the background and burns in my cutouts at the same time. And now I can start playing around with some other effects. So I can, for instance, darken this down, maybe a bit more. Oh, it's probably too dark. Um, and we can start putting some, play, playing around with some lights. Some point lights on these. Ooh, wrong. I should have put that in so I could see it. So um, we can add it with a brush. The, the program comes a whole library of, of components of different brush shapes, uh, textures, people. There's about two and a half thousand that come on the DVD. It is a DVD because it won't fit on the CD. So you can actually just do some kind of lens flare techniques there. So you can see you've got a series of, of, of kind of lights you can do. You can do a point light, a, a spotlight, and you can actually do a linear type of strip light, maybe along the underneath the eaves here. You get the general idea. So that, that, that's some the more advanced techniques you can use for actually playing around with lighting. Has anybody got any questions on any of that? You can fake it by actually painting the window frames. One of the problems we have at the moment is each pixel's only got one depth, so you can't actually get in behind the glass to paint. And maybe this is a time to um, talk about that. There's a kind of trick you can play with, with glass. You could, um, let me just show you that. Let's go into, into SketchUp. OK, so we've got, we've got a SketchUp model here. Um, and what I'm going to do, um, layers, where's layers? There we go. You can see I've modeled this so that all my glass is on one particular layer. So then this, this enables me to turn off the glass and create an EPIX file from here. So file, export, 2D graphic, select EPIX. We just put this on the desktop. Robin will talk through some of the options of actually creating EPIX files la later on. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up the sister program that comes with Piranesi called Viduti, which is just a tool that was put there for actually converting um, DXF files for Autodesk users into EPIX files, because that's the only workflow they have at the moment. But uh, we can open, actually open up open up SketchUp files in Viduti. So let's go to the desktop. Watch. It's, it's pretty clunky viewing mechanism, but I don't really care about that. What I want to do is look at my material window here. And what I want to do is select my glass, 
It's called Glass One, and I'm going to export all my materials as a faces with that material to to a cutout file. So I just press this, and on the desktop create a, a, what's called a PCF file, which is a Perinazi cutout file. Now I've done that, I can marry those two files together, so I can open up the. Top the Lodge No Glass, and then from my cutout manager, I can import that cutout file that I created. And you see, it then renders those into the glass into the scene. And I can double click it to make it current, and then I can start playing around with its opacity and reapply it. Or I can make it invisible. So now I can paint behind. So let's put, make the walls red, for instance. I can paint through, if I have material lock on, of course. Paint the individual rooms. Actually, if I do undo contiguous, I can re do the whole room at once. Oh, I see. It's because it's the outside. The outside walls the same as the inside walls. Let's keep that on, and then you can turn your glass back on. So it's a kind of technique that you can use for actually working with glass. So you can actually, if you're working on shop fronts or something like that, you can have your glass as a cutout, which you can turn on and off, and then still work with inside the shop. Okay, Does that makes sense. I can if um, I turn the glass off, and then I can put anything behind that glass. Yeah? I could, let me see if I can find a cutout. So what I'm, I'm going to do is just put some on the ground and point it through. Why didn't that work? Sorry? No. You can do it. I know you can. There we go. I know, I know you can turn, turn the glass back on. Yeah. Now, if you're going to paint up more than one view of a scene, it is best to place your cutouts in, and then from the cutout manager, save, save your files, your cutouts to a, dip, um, a Piranesi cutout file. So then, if we've got a different view of your model, come on, talk to me. OK, so it's the same model as I was painting up before, but I've got a completely different view of it. I can now import the cutout from the previous file. And you can see that either they're 3D model ones that are actually placed in the world, and you see them from a different side. So the, the, um, or they're 2D face me ones, and then they turn around to face the face the camera. And it's just going to be a little slow because it's going to calculate all the shadows now. Come on, I need a faster computer. I, w I would wait and do it in here, if you got this. If you put compo more and more components into your SketchUp model or your textures on it, you, you, you eventually find that it kind of gets a bit slow to navigate. Yeah, you can turn them off, but um, it's, it's a workflow. It's a personal preference. Personally, I, I always add them afterwards. OK. Um, one last thing I'd like to show, going back to Let's open an, another file.
One of the things you can do with cutouts um, is actually use these effects up here as well. So I can, for, in, for instance, let me just put this into outline mode and actually turn on a linear fade as well. Actually, let, no, let me just show you, let me show you something different. I've got five minutes left, this would be better. Okay, so this, this is a, a different, it's the same view, just being painted up by somebody else who, who likes to use the reflection tool to put, it looks like a glass pavement in there. Um, one of the things we can do is, because of the depth channel, we can use what's called linear fade. So, based upon depth, we can paint, we can paint. So we can have full effect there and say no effect here. And we paint with the alley, you can sort of see that it, actually let's just make it go a bit further through here and reapply it. It, it, it actually graduates through the image. But not only can we apply paint, we can actually apply effects. So we can actually run a blur filter across that. So let's select a blur filter and apply that. This this take a little while, but what you'll see is it is can you see it's it's blurring things in the background? Sort of the trees become a bit blurred and the backgrounds become a lot more blurred. And it's given like a depth of field from a camera type effect. And, and then the, the eyes then tripped more into looking into the model rather than to looking into the background and the trees and stuff like that. And you can then do that in reverse from the front. So you can say, I want full effect here, no effect there, and apply that. And you get the true um, depth of field effect from a camera. OK, I've done my half an hour. So I'll take some questions while Robin swaps over. Yeah? Before when you got the version of this that was turned around and you reloaded, yeah. could you back up and show how did you do that? How did you make sure that it referenced how you placed the... Okay. Well, the, the mechanism of doing that is, is you, you place your cutouts and then they come in. So let me just place one more in here. Doesn't matter. You place a cutout and it comes in here. And while it's still floating, you can go save. That will create a file, which you can then go into another one and use the import tool to bring it in. Do you want to swap over, Robin? Yeah. Could you show maybe one or two one-button techniques? One or two one-button techniques. Oh, what should we have then? It's a multi we would do a multi-fill. Um, I'll do this one. I don't particularly like it, but it shows you what you get. This is basically um, what you can do is set Piranesi up to s replay fill cans one after the other by just putting them into a folder in a, a library file and pointing to them. So if you can do an effect just using fill cans, you can save them away and then run them again later. Any more questions? I'm just going to rip this away now. All right, good afternoon. Um, first thing, I'd like to say what a privilege it is to be here and share with my colleagues. It's important that you know that I'm not a member of Piranesi. I'm an architect in Miami. And I started using this program three or four years ago when it first came out. I was quite enamored by it because it filled a real gap in computer digital imaging that just wasn't available through the standard two-dimensional program. So in short order, I learned as much as I could about the program and, you know, in the past year or so, I've made it commercially viable. So that's one thing I wanted to point out is that this is an art medium and I do charge standard rates and it is a way to, profit's not a dirty word, right? So this is a tool to use on a daily basis in your practice. Uh, as much as it's a nice medium, it's also a functional medium. So I wanted to point that out, that it's a, it's a real product. Um, what I want to share this afternoon is how I personally make the paintings. There's a, tons of people out there in the community that use this program. 
uh, you know, I've developed three or four styles that just came out, uh, out from my own hand, just like any artist would. So this is an art medium, and every person is going to get a different result. I just want to share how I make a watercolor type image, which, which would look like this. You know, that might have taken from zero to three finished renderings in a weekend or something at, at full market value. And the, the initial designs were just tracing paper designs. I sketched, made the buildings in SketchUp, and then went along and rendered three in a series. So what I'd like to do, just really quick, uh, I'd really like to open up the floor. I appreciate we're all colleagues here. Please just inundate me with questions or at least some kind of facial expression that you're not in church or something that I can enjoy each other's company for the next half an hour. Thank you. Um, I think real quick, I'll just go through some of the, some of the shots that I brought along and just quickly, just quickly pop through so you can see what I've been doing. Some are at different levels of quality and I do have to apologize. The images are kind of washed out on the screen, on the projector. When I see them on the screen, they're very vibrant. Okay, so there's a lot more detail than, than shows up on the screen. So, so this is a neat kind of Remy Macintosh kind of style. Uh, that's one that I kind of call my own, but. Now, this is one of a series of three or four. We'll see a few more shots of this, this job. This is one of the first ones that I did, and this is one I, my, maybe my second post to, to the Piranesi website. And Susan Sorger, who's in the audience today, gave me a critique, and I took to heart her critiques and, and made this picture. There's extreme black, perfect white, depth of field, and your eye gets drawn along, and there's all kinds of neat things you can't see to make it happen, but um, really like any real piece of art, it takes a few tries to get it just right. So this, this, does, this, is, a, this is a two dimensional AutoCAD picture. It doesn't have to be a three, well, let me correct myself. A two dimensional AutoCAD picture was put into SketchUp and then export it from SketchUp into an EPIX file. So you can paint in 2D, you don't have to model everything. This is quite a nice shot here because um, all the ocean and everything else, that was a Google Earth actual image of the site as well. So it helps to integrate a bunch of technologies together. Let's just see here. Okay, same job. Um, sometimes I try and do them kind of photorealistic. This one's kind of neat because it has kind of a burlap grain across everything to make it look like it's really on canvas. And, and I made this one look a lot more watercolor-like, where the uh, it's a bit more, more monochromatic, I guess you could say. It's not, it's not as much depth like a real watercolor painting might have for architecture. This was a series of three for a resort in Punta Mar, oops, which is in Panama. Let me just quickly brush through these. This image is kind of important. That's the same picture you saw a few slides back that had just kind of a, a block color fills. That, you know, that took probably 15 or 20 minutes to make that picture. So we can, we can discuss as architects different techniques and colors and all kinds of cool things as a tool, right? So we can use this on a, a lot of fronts, and that's one of the reasons why I like it. Let's see here. Now, this is just from the other day. This is in Turks and Caicos. Yeah. All right. That was, that was a pretty heavy-duty SketchUp model. Each one of these buildings is complete in every respect. And it might have been a 150 meg model, and including the site contours and whatever. But this, this, I mean, it's a lot of fun, too. I mean, don't get me wrong. As an, as an artist or an architect, you're allowed to enjoy your job. And this is one of those things where I can't believe I get paid to do what I do, right? Most of these are, are developed from SketchUp models. 100% from SketchUp, yes. And, and relatively easy, to tell you the truth, right? This, this uh, is the sister of an image I'm going to try and paint again today. This is kind of a fun one. This is a quick section through SketchUp. And I just threw on some uh, burlap texture and threw on a few trees just for a quick presentation. But there again, this is kind of a value-added product that when you go into a meeting with this versus a, a black and white tracing paper, you, you do look a little more professional and a lot more client confidence. Is it watermark? No, it's just, it's just a grain, it's called. Well, I mean, there is a the burlap look. Um, well, we'll do the, the, the wiggly kind of um, Hessian burlap look is just a grain that you just apply in Piranesi. Yeah, okay, it's a Piranesi Correct, yeah. I mean, similar that you might do in the Adobe products or whatever. You just wash it on there. Or as you go, keep it turned on. This again, this is a flat two-dimensional AutoCAD drawing that I exported to AutoCAD and then exported to Piranesi through EPICS. 
So it doesn't have to be a three-dimensional picture. It can just be a 2D picture as well. Yeah, I just made them. Correct, correct, yeah. Correct, yeah. But Brian Woodward quickly touched on the fact about the locks and the masking aspect. Because you don't have to mask anything in Piranesi as compared to other products, the, it, it, it sees the materials. It sees elevation as well. You can say anything along this plane. Please paint just this plane. Or any, any kind of windows, doors, you name it. Um, it saves a considerable amount of time so you can focus on producing art as opposed, as opposed to being an operator of Photoshop or whatever. Okay, I guess we're back, so let me just close that down. All right, so my presentation is in two parts. The, qu the quick, simple part at the beginning is make sure you do an excellent SketchUp model, okay? Piranesi will only paint what's there. You can, it's true you can add uh, faces and planes and things, but ideally it's better off done in SketchUp, okay? But I, what I do personally is I use all the mapping in SketchUp for the textures as placeholders for the textures that will come later. Some people like to have a, a blank SketchUp model and start from that. I like to have the, the roofs, the walls, the doors, the, the, the ground, everything there. Then I can embellish, change, fix later on in Piranesi. So let me just start my SketchUp model I'm going to paint today. This is just a standard model. Um, it happens to be a, um, a villa in the British Virgin Islands, a place called Lambert Beach, where I used to live in Tortola. And just a bit about composition. This is a Su Susan Sorger special here, but um, generally you can say you can divide the picture into thirds horizontally or thirds vertically. So what you want to do is set up a picture that's quite, that's quite dynamic in itself without being colored. Like if I were to pick that picture, that's a pretty neat picture sitting there. There's, there's lots of drama that you can play on when you go to paint. What, what you really don't want to do is just kind of have a, a blob right in the middle of the, of, the, of the image. So when you set up a picture to be painted, please make sure you have lots of space around to add entourage, which is to say the, the clip art, and lots of space for uh, whites and fades and things because you're actually creating a piece of art. I, I guess I keep stressing that. This is an art medium, right? You just don't touch a button and every person will get a different result. So what I'm gonna do is basically set up a picture that I think would look quite good. Let's see, like that. So, all right, so these materials are, are generally accurate and they are also placeholders. Turn on my shadows, and pretty much that's the picture that I'm going to want to uh, achieve. So just a little now, as I go to export, please understand that DPI, dots per inch, are very important, okay? I generally present things on 11 by 17, and I'm going to want the industry standard of minimum of 300 DPI. So if you consider that there's a half an inch border, generally speaking, on 11 by 17 paper when you go to print, that gives you actually 16 inches across. So take 16 inches and times it by 300, and you get the, the number 4,800. So when I export from SketchUp, I'm gonna say, please give me 4,800 pixels width. So that when I, when I go to print, I have the equivalent of 300 DPI. It's important that you know that, for example, when I say export, two-dimensional graphic, and I go down here from the, the carrot pull down and pick EPIX, when I do that, the options come on, and they ask me, do you wanna use the view size? which is considerably smaller than 4,800. 4, Sorry. There we go. Now why this is important is that all your clip art entourage comes in uh, with, with a high resolution. But if, if you trip it up before you start and give it a low resolution, your people and your trees and all the good stuff, they're already going to be severely degraded, very grainy and very pixelated. So you're going to want to make this as high a number as your computer will, will, will take. And to the best of my knowledge, I haven't tried to because I haven't needed to, but I, I would say that it gets, it's going to get a pretty heavy file. I've done 9,000. All right, so, so Susan, Susan says she's done 9,000 DPI, uh, 9,000 pixel width. Okay, but, but for me, even at 300 DPI, when I, when I go 24 by 36 or Arch D size, it's perfect. 150 DPI on a plotter comes out fantastic. So. So, so I'm just saying, as an industry standard, if you don't know where to start, this is it. There's also some other buttons down here with the EPIX export filters, export edges, textures, ground plane. Generally, I click them all because it gives you more control later on. So j just standard Windows, you just go and say, where do you want this thing to live? And you say export. Now, with the magic of computing, of course, I have that already done. And it's sitting right there, okay? So one thing is, 
that's really fun on this is that you get, unlike other programs, you get to try again and again and again until you get your fill or your people or your embellishments correct. Okay, so I'm going to start off. Because I know I'm going to want to make a watercolor style, all of the bitmaps and textures that I'm going to choose, whether from my own library or from the internet or where you, where you purchase them from third-party suppliers, I'm going to use the watercolor style ones. Now, I can not alter them later, but it just gives me a bit more uh, effective kind of look here. So what I'm going to do real quick, um, I'm going to fill out my sky. Okay, so now this is where I'm going to show you as a colleague what I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So I'm going to fill the sky, and what just happened there was that with the global bucket on, I filled every aspect of the sky, because see up here in material it says sky, every little nook and cranny that's buried behind um, railings or, or void spots that Photoshop wouldn't get, for example, this gets automatically. Uh, it, yeah, it's just slightly different, the control panel. But. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm saying, please fill the sky with this really cool background texture. But the texture was off-center, and it didn't fit, and it was the wrong size. So I'm going to say, please move my texture to here. And the second I let go, it redoes it, reapplies it. So that's what I mean about trying again and again and again. You can tweak things like crazy when I'm done. I just say, OK, thank you very much, right? So when we uh, this, uh, so you can see that when we zoom in, our painting is already starting to look like a watercolor. When you created this in SketchUp, did you have to define an area called sky, or is it just assume that's the background? Okay, so the question was, in SketchUp, do I have to define sky, for example, or any other area? And the answer to that is no, is that in, in the case of sky, it automatically comes in. In ground, you have to have ground turned on in SketchUp. And you say export ground plane. So sky is one of the ones that you got, that happens by itself. All right, so, so generally speaking, I do it the same way every time. I, I give a general feel for the picture based on the sky, and then work forward from that. So for example, I'm going to try and anchor the picture now. I'm going to create things in the foreground and the background that are going to tell the viewer what's close and what's far away. I'm not going to pay any attention right now to color, well, to depth and intensity. That's going to come later. Now, I've got to give you a caveat. If this doesn't work, there we go. i just got to go and find this tree. For whatever reason, this one tree never, never clicks in. But let me just real quick. Informatics. OK. One thing I re was really impressed with Piranesi, they have extensive libraries that come with the program. So this is actually a, a third-party purchase library. However, there's, there's uh, tons and tons that come with the program itself. All right. So in this case, I say to it, OK, I want a tree about here. And it should calculate the shadows for me. There we go. Let's see. It's real fast. Let me just really quickly see if the shadow is going to turn on. I, what I'm hoping to see is if the shadow hits the walls. And if it doesn't, I'm just going to pick them so that it does. OK, there we go. So that's one thing that's really spectacular about Piranesi is because it came from a three-dimensional SketchUp model, it knows what's close and far away. So when I lay up shadows like right there, it'll drape across. And that's with regards to this business here with depth, right? So it knows what's close and what's far away based on the pixel depth. Light direction, it also takes from the SketchUp model. Sorry, light direction? Yeah. Okay, no, okay, the question was, do the shadow angles match the shadow angles from SketchUp? And the answer to that is no. You have to manually pick them. And, okay, okay, once. And why it's important for me is that if I do a whole series of paintings between three and six paintings simultaneously, because you just move the windows, you know, that I have to repick the shadows for each individual one. But it's, it's a very, very minor thing you have to do. But it's, it's a spectacular option. I mean, it's, to, to have your shadows drape across 15 or 17 things by themselves is very, very impressive, very realistic. So let's get rid of those trees. And let me just see. All right, so the magic of computing. Let me just see if I can open up B. You set all your shadow settings in SketchUp before you ever get I'm sorry, go say that again. You can all shadow settings and directions in SketchUp before you ever get 
Well, sure. It's just a standard SketchUp shadow, just what looks good, just just to the to the eye. All right, let's see how this gets me here. Okay, unfortunately, I'm going to have to do this a few times. Let me just advance a little bit more down. I realize I'm running out of time. So I'm going to go open up a, a bit farther down the road. Let's just see what I get with this one here. Now it's going to, now that is crazy. Let me just see what's going on here. Okay. Well, that's what we understand. Yeah. Error boxes. Strange. No, it, it's Murphy's Law. Murphy. Very good. All right, so that's Murphy's Law. That's, that's fine, yeah. Okay, so that's just Murphy's Law. There we go. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. On XP, you need to make sure you've got at least three or four gig of memory in, in your laptop for those high-resolution images. If you're working at 2K, you're, you're OK. Um, with XP, also, you can't just use three gigabytes of memory out, out of the um, box. You've actually got to configure the operating system. And if you don't know how to do that, if you drop us an email, we'll, we'll tell you how to do that. Um, we're working on that at the moment, yeah. So what, what this is going to illustrate now is that I selectively and kind of systematically lay up different layers of entourage, um, generally by species. I might do all the bushes or all the trees or all the people or something like that. And then afterwards, I'd come along and start to embellish what's there. So that's the next phase, right? Embellishment. I would use colors and fades to color in the water quite nicely. I'll show you how I do the windows. One second. All right. Good, okay, so this is just before I re-render the thing, which is to say kind of burn it all in and make it one complete image again. So for example, um, I'll, I'll just show you how I would paint a, a piece of this waterfall here coming off the front of the building. Okay, here. Okay, fade, pick, boom, boom, color, dark blue. All right, so I can selectively start to, as an artist, I mean, this is very extreme to make a point. It takes a long time, but in any given time, it might take me two or three hours probably to paint a picture complete. So it's not, it's not very much time at all. So by, by doing this, I can just use an artist kind of eye to get things like, um, let's just see here. Okay, so the window streaks. This business with locks is exceptional. It means I don't have to mask anything off. So if I were just to paint this window, I can just come in and put some neat little little effects in the windows anywhere that I want without touching anything else. You know, so the, the so the time savings in that is is pretty significant. So let's just see if I go like this here. I'll just go like that. Let's see, boom. Put down the dark blue. All right, that's good enough for now. Let me just see if I can open up the next one. Oh, let, let, me, let me just continue. This button here, this is called re-render. And in my own Canadian colloquial English, I call that burn-in. What it does is takes everything and flattens it out. That's the uh, merge option in Photoshop. Just puts it all into one big gigantic file. And once that happens, you better be pretty sure because you can't really move. Right, right now, with my, with my library, my entourage, I can actually select all my entourage pieces. For example, this, this large bush up here. I can just turn it on and turn it off anytime I want. Oh, sorry, wrong button right there. And there comes a point in time where you have to commit to the picture to keep going. So I'll show you what happens next here. All right. Let's just see here. Now, this is quite unusual. I really taxed my computer this afternoon. 
had a whole bunch of things open. So I can usually run between four and six images in, in Piranesi without any problems whatsoever. Okay. All right. Okay, so here's what happens. When you burn this picture in with re-render, um, right fill. Everything becomes one sheet. Then I would fill it with white, and why I use white, you can use any color you want, like parchment paper or something neat, but white is going to help me uh, during the brochure process or the marketing process or distributing the artwork, because generally speaking, it's on a white page. So when I fade my picture into the middle, which generally happens, the white edges just blend out into nothing. So sometimes you want a picture with a hard edge, and sometimes you want it with a fade. So what I'm going to do now, this is, this, is, this is the fantastic thing that I really like now. This is restore. So I'm going to very carefully and you know, selectively restore the picture back, and this is when it's going to start to look like a painting, as opposed to a standard Photoshop look or a 2D <laughs> 3D render program. So just like magic, the picture is going to come out from this white fill that I put on top. Click and drag in there. No, just one click. If I click and drag, it'll come with. And so I, I'm, I'm just clicking uh, relatively selectively. Now, the reason it's coming out very subtle is I have the blend, restore blend option very low. Right now, let's be blotch, it comes right back up. So let me just back up. All right, I'll set that down to about a bit more than normal. So this, this is the longest part of the process. So I'm just going to delineate where I want my image to, to live. The, the paintbrush itself is, a, in this case, a PNG um, image file. It can be a TIFF or, or a JPEG or anything, but it also has the, the black and white intensities changed so that the restoration of the picture is not completely uniform. At any point, I can switch from a brush to a bucket, and it will, it will just bucket fill the whole thing or, or restore the whole thing. So you restore just one plane? No, because I'd hit the re-render button, right now everything is, is back. To, well, well let, me, let me correct myself. You can restore one plane. All the 3D capabilities are still there. But right now, I'm kind of working just globally with no locks on so that everything gets hit. So, the question was, was I just restoring one plane? So I, I'll show you what, what that would be if that was not the case. Right? I could just, just restore the roof itself, or I could just restore the windows globally on the entire picture, which doesn't look half bad. So let me go back here. So it, it keeps all that information after you do your research. Yes, it does, yeah. The, it, it still remains, um, I guess Brian could correct me, but it's almost like a 2.5D picture. It's a 3D picture on a two-dimensional plane, and that's part of the magic of what it does. It takes, takes three you know, images, if you, if you will, and combines them into one to be used with this, uh, with this style. So let me just quickly, quickly keep going along. And this time I'm going to switch to the bucket restore so that I can selectively restore this tree, for example, so that it becomes more into the foreground. And any of the plants down here, I'm going to restore those. I'm also pay paying attention to where it says material because you're going to see that it goes all over the place when I hover over top of any given material. So I'll kind of selectively make sure that when I go to restore something that it's, it's what I want to restore. Because, for example, I could just restore the grass like crazy and wouldn't necessarily be what I wanted to do. So. Yeah, the question was, am I clicking multiple times? And the answer is yes. And the reason is right now with my restore over here and blend amount at 16, that it, it restores 16% each time I click. So if I were to, for example, if it was at 20% and I click five times, it'd be 100% restore. Absolutely. Like say, for example, here there's a, there's a slightly curved wall right here. I can restore just the curved aspects of that thing. The bucket, blend, paint, that. Let's just see what I get here. 
Yeah, so here, th that's the edge. And I can just restore a little bit of that, that thing there. And, and by doing that, it's going to delineate where that wall stops and starts. And, and just like right here, let's just see. Now, even though right now I'm doing restore, I could paint this stuff. Anytime I want to change the entire house color, for example, I could change that for the clients watching. You could just paint it right in front of them and say, would you like this, this, this? Although I don't recommend that. Just, just, uh, uh, yeah, the, especially if it's a husband and wife team. I'm married and happily married, but it's, it can be tough sometimes. So avoid that if you can as a professional. And I will open the finished product here after a, approximately two hours work. Let's see, open, final. All right. And let me just go back, sorry. All right. So this is what it looks like when it's done, right? By carefully restoring, adding um, focus on planes that are uh, in shadow, bringing out the colors a little bit. One of the locks is actually a color lock, which is exceptionally good for making sure these bricks and uh, these rocks are highlighted just on the, the darker parts while the light ones are left behind. Let me just see here. You can kind of get a kind of get a feel for what's going on. So when it's when it's painted, it does look pretty pretty realistic as far as a hand rendered watercolor. All right, so now you guys can really help me out with some questions because uh, I'm kind of dying off here. All right, sir. The kiss of death is the what's sometimes referred to as the rubber stamp effect. Mm -hmm. All foliage looks the same. As soon right. as the eye picks up, it's over. Correct. What do you do to vary that? Can you reverse? Can you scale? Can you uh, in, in right. your, your stamping, basically, the uh, All right. Okay, so the question was, on your, on your montage or your, your clip art, can you alter them so that they do not look like a rubber stamp? And the answer is absolutely yes. You can mirror them, you can squish each one individually, change it, rotate it, do anything you want, and, and it does add a lot of vibrancy to the picture when, you can, when it looks like a hand drawing. Well, well, the thing is, when you have a, when, when your montage um, library is still kind of functional before you burn it all in, each one is a separate entity. So you can selectively pick any, any given tree and just squish that one, morph it, spin it, whatever you want to do. Especially if it's people or furniture or cars and things, you can spin them all around and do everything you want. Yeah. Well, recently I've started to make my own libraries, uh, just for example right here, just, just so that that is avoided. You know, like all, all, these are all mine that I, I made from um, just, just um, Photoshop type images. You, it's very painstaking, you have to trace around and get rid of the background and then put them in here. But the beauty of that is once they're in a Piranesi format, you can apply any filter you want to it later on. So, so I keep them pure, in, in a matter of speaking, of a, of a photographic snapshot. Then you can turn them into a, a hand rendering or a, a watercolor or a gouache or a tempera, or anything you want later on. So it gets great flexibility that way. All right, this question here. No. Yeah, this next, it's a third party from Arch Vision. Right, well, yeah, yeah, RPC, yeah. Okay. yeah. But you can use those in Piranesi. Yeah, there's a sample card that comes with the program, but yeah. Uh, question here in the center. Do your brushes um, have pressure sensitivity if you're using the stylus? Yeah, if you've got a tablet, there's, you can control the, the size and the opacity of the brush based upon pressure. Right. Well, one thing, I'm left-handed, and I do have a very large Wacom pressure-sensitive tablet. And the, the size of the pressure-sensitive area is actually the same size as the screen. So, so the one-to-one -one correlation, if you paint with the stylus from here to here, six inches diagonally, it will be six inches on the screen. So, so the pressure is the same way. Like, it's almost like you're touching the computer screens. Definitely recommend that. Questions? Anyone? Right. 
Yes, yeah, so, uh, I mentioned before, Piranesi comes with extensive libraries already of, of brushes or, or skies or foils. Let me just quickly show you with the Windows Explorer, uh, one of my, my style kind of uh, skies and things. Now, at least two-thirds of these came with Pyrenees. Sometimes I use my old paintings like this as posters on a wall. The old ones beginning sky came with Piranesi. Yeah, so these, these are certainly some of the ones that come with. The British are quite inge ingenious. They say the sky images are called sky. And so they come, all, they all, all the stuff that I have are all crazy yeah. names, like this crazy Canadian, and the British are very organized, so they're all called well, sky. We, we did start calling all the entourage, <laughs> like youth in brown coat and stuff. But <laughs> after about 50, you run out of names. Yeah, yeah. Spend more time trying to name them right. than actually tracing them. Here's some interesting things. A lot of times in my pictures, if I do it to look like a tracing paper, I'll stick some tape dots on the corners. So I'll, I'll put a tracing paper filter and stick some tape dots all around the corners and then print it, and it almost looks like a real, you know, a real tracing paper, right? But you can see one thing I'd, I'm hoping to pass on is a lot of fun. All right, this is, this is a very joy-filled exercise. There, there's a learning curve like any program, but I, I wouldn't consider it a, a very steep learning curve. But the potentials that it opens up for your, you know, for your daily life are well worth the minor effort required to learn the program. So, and because it dovetails so perfectly with SketchUp, I think it's a natural extension for a lot of people to, to go that way. Okay, uh, the question was what kind of bit depth in terms of color depth does it deal with? It, the, the color in Piranesi is, is all 24 bit. So, so when you export, you get the full 24 bits. Um, in, in version 5, there is a bit of color management there as well. But if you really into pre press and stuff like that, I'd export it to Photoshop and use that. Not what well, you mean HDRI? No, not the moment. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, everything that, that came with Piranesi, you can complement with your own similar type things. So for example, I made an entire library of my own brushes that I like to use. And these, these can be applied with any transparency, any color, any fill. You can actually paint textures, like bitmaps, with the brushes. So you could selectively paint in certain clouds or certain trees or something on a bitmap image. It's like a, the old joke of a can of a tartan paint where you paint it and it comes out as a tartan pattern. In a, in a manner of speaking, that's what it does. It's very impressive that way. Susan. Sure. Okay, the question was, can you please explain how the shadows work in Piranesi? Um, Piranesi is a single image renderer, right? It doesn't spin around. You can't look at it in any other angle. So once you get that angle correct, it's good for anything that you put in. Any entourage piece will have the same shadow angle. So let me show you that. Down. Um, at work, I have two screens. So I would have on my left hand screen the, the interface, and the right hand screen all of my libraries and styles and pens and things. It makes it a lot more efficient, so I'd recommend that if you'd consider that. All right. Let me go back. So I'm going to say to this tree, please make it about a 240 inches tall. There we go. Turn off my locks. Blend is 100. Everything else is 100. And I'm going to say to it, please include shadows. And I'm just going to give it a, a shot. I'm just going to say go. Okay. I'm just going to click it on once. Um, one thing I thought I'd point out. There you go. Okay. So it just turns out that's a pretty reasonable angle. I'm going, to, I'm going to pick something else. I'm going to say to the shadows themselves, pick shadow direction, please come from here on the object way down to here on the ground. And then I'm going to reapply that. And now the shadows come in a different direction. Now how you get them to be realistic 
is find a shadow location on your model and, and mimic it. So show what I mean. Let's just see here. Okay, so here's, here's a perfect one here. This edge of my eave comes here and I'd like it to be about there. So now when I pick this picture, it, it should be realistic after that. So there you go. So that, that's really what it would look like. You can kind of see the shadows in the background here against the walls. Um, I do have version 5, and the reason is I just uh, have been going so fast. I have it installed and I've messed with it, it's fantastic. I've just been, just been avalanche with work, so I haven't really delved into it very much yet. That's one of the problems, I mean, you get good at anything, and for some strange reason, people want you to keep doing it, so I don't know. You're doing I, renderings for other firms? No, uh, I'm an associate with a multinational firm. I have lots of responsibilities. You, and on the side, I do renderings or for work, but generally on the side, I do renderings. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we ought to wrap up now because the, the keynote's in, in five minutes to give people time to get downstairs. Um, I'm around for the rest of the week. If anybody's got any questions, um, they can find me around. Um, I can do, do a demo, answer any of your questions, any problems you're having. So just come and find me. Thanks for being here.